Hello everyone, this is the Fast Politics Asia and uh, this is the summary for the day of 192 to 194 for the 3rd to the 5th of September. So uh, I wasn't able to cover, it, uh, cover this every day because I really wanted to, uh, but I'm overseas. So previously, uh, you sh you, the, the previous summary, if you have watched, you know that I'm in Malaysia. Now, now I'm in Indonesia. So uh, it's, the schedule has been uh, really impossible for me to you know, do any updates. So anyway, so now let's cover the past three days uh, things that had happened over in the Ukraine. So um, first thing first, um, Zelensky uh, in a very, uh, okay, so all, their vid all his videos is unusual. So anyway, his unusual video, he actually claimed that he had visited the yeah, military HQ and then they, he learned that the Ukrainian forces have captured one settlement in Donetsk and uh, two settlements in the southern front. So uh, he said that he thanked the soldiers of the 63rd Battalion of the 103rd Brigade of Territorial Defense and they kept they liberated one settlement. And then they have the 52nd Separate Motorized Infantry Battalion and they liberated two settlements. So uh, it wasn't really clear, you know, which settlements are captured. Perhaps uh, some of the other mappers that are following the you know the units around might know better so um my guess is that the two settlements could you know, refer to you know, a multitude of uh, twins uh, so there's there's a possibility where he was referring to stukistavok and kostromka and or he could be also uh, refer to, referring to actually the capture of uh, Bisokopilia and ohaine might be so on the Donetsk side, uh, that's even more confusing uh, because uh, there is a lot of uh, a lot of uh, locations or settlements that is being disputed uh, by the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense, and so it could be you no know, anything. So I not too sure, but it's just another one of those uh, very weird uh, statements putting up, put up by Ukraine. <clears throat> but interestingly, I have saw this piece of information uh, on Intel Slava, a pro-Russian uh, Telegram channel. So they say that according to uh, this another channel, uh, Legitimini, uh, which I, I do not follow, not sure where to follow also, uh, they say that they, the entire Kherson offensive or uh, Kherson operation by the Ukrainians actually comes in five different waves. So the first wave is actually a strike groups of special forces, approximately, approximately 5,000 people. And then immediately uh, it will be followed with a second wave uh, that is by the regular units of the armed forces of Ukraine. So these are the ones that fought through the past uh, six months and uh, six, seven months. So they are the ones with a uh, good combat experience, approximately 10,000 soldiers. Then uh, another third and fourth wave, which this, uh, which Intel's Slava claim is the one that is uh, currently underway. Uh, consisted of the special forces and, uh, and and also Ukrainian forces of combat experience of at least four months. So there is another 10,000 soldiers. So it seems like the third and fourth wave might be 5,000, 5,000 since uh, it's you know, two waves, but there's only 10,000. But then there, there will be a fifth wave, which is actually the, the reserve force of 20,000, which consists of the regular troops and the territorial defense so this looks like a decent plan if you ask me although i would have preferred third and fourth wave to be uh, ten thousand each uh, but it's also surprising that uh, we are only not even a week in and we are already at the third and fourth wave so uh, that's a bit fast so um this also uh coll corroborates with some of the informations that are coming out like for example uh, Ukrainian reinforcement is reported on the 5th of September. So uh, this is according to the pro-Russian source driver that at 8 p.m. Uh, they are planning to... Uh, no, so not in all the time, sorry. So they think that they are sending uh, more troops uh, over into the Devadi Brick front, uh, including 30 units of engineering equipment uh, where they are trying to build up more, more river crossings and there are also more infantry arriving at the Varysnego Vatoye station uh, in civilian trucks and buses. So this is actually the railway station over here just off the Devon Deep Bridge front. So 
uh, the train station is actually here. This is the train station. It's actually named after the city here, the Bresnia Huvate. So the troops are uh, all transported here and then they will be sent to the front. So uh, reminis reminds me of some of the war films that I watched about World War II though. So, uh, so there's some uh, interesting information. So uh, moving to the Southern France, at the Southern France we have a uh, we have uh, an operation by the Ukrainians uh, to restart the fighting over here at the Pasaporovsky area where they launched a, a wide uh, offensive from Blahodatny all the way to Zeleny High Tenovi Podi and uh, this is supported by the Air Force uh, with uh, ground support aircraft of Sukhoi 25 however two of them were shot down during this operation so fighting is reported uh, across the entire Tonovi uh, Podi, Zelene Hai, Blachodetni uh, region. So, consisting of uh, the tactical group of 24, 28, and 59 brigade. And um, so, they, in this offensive, they actually go, go by the very uh, traditional, very classical offensive way by actually using artillery first. And then, uh, and then they actually move in. So, However, these forces uh, were actually you know, defeated by the, uh, by the Russian side and then they actually still captured some commanders as well. And, and uh, so we are, we, because this operation is actually on the 5th of September, um, we will see in the next day's summary, we will see whether, uh, so in tomorrow's uh, maybe Russian report, maybe RIBA, maybe Ukrainian Ministry of Defense report, You'll probably see more information on this. So this is a uh, preliminary information coming out from the Russian source driver. And uh, but before this uh, operation happened, there was actually a Russian push uh, north of probably north of Tonovi Podi, where they actually uh, uh, captured a commander of a company of the 59 uh, separate mechanized brigade. I think. This the rank of this commander is probably not higher than a captain, so it's not very high ranking. But the commander, uh, the word commander might be very deceiving, and they also, uh, but apparently, why why the significance was that he's also you know the commander of the right sector of a detachment. So not sure lah. So you know, uh, all this kind of information is very uh, too granular, uh, too 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 micro. So we should uh, I prefer to go on the macro scale. So we look at the picture here, we can see that uh, the Ukrainians continue to hold uh, their positions that they have captured in the earlier uh, offensive, uh, earlier days of the first, the first few days of the offensive, and they are trying to, you know, consolidate and uh, get more gains. But however, the, the Russians are pretty well prepared. And while this is happening, uh, there is a video, um, a video of uh, a train going past the Crimean Bridge and um, there is a whole line of, of uh, red, red, red trucks and uh, also of armored vehicles and uh, this is this looks like a very massive uh, reinforcement coming up from Russia into Crimea and probably going into the Kherson front so um, it's still some days away I guess uh, because this this uh, picture is this video is taken on the 4th Sorry, this is not May 4th of uh, September. And uh, probably you take maybe three days, I guess, two to three days, I'm supposing, to you know reach the actual front. And that will be probably we'll probably see them uh reaching the front around just over the past 24 hours or tomorrow, and then they will be re they will be organized and moved to the front. Because um they are not just have to move to Kherson, they have to actually cross uh either one of these bridges to actually get to the front so it's going to take a, quite some time for them to reach the front but uh the reinforcement also do do shows that the russian ministry of defense is taking the ukrainian uh, kherson offensive uh, very very seriously so um at the snihurivka region or the partizanske region there's no more ground offensive uh, the russian defense seems to have helped uh, against the ukrainian side and uh, there is a Sukhoi 25, however, shot down over Stinghu Rivka. Um, there is no ground offensive here, so I, this aircraft is either doing uh, isolated strikes or they might actually be uh, 
flying from the region of the Devaney Bridge front and then got shot down as they was you know maybe returning home you know RTB returned to base uh, around this region here so um so the in terms of the Mikolai front region uh, I I feel that the Ukrainians are maybe running out of steam a, a bit so they are trying to push push here to try to you know see if they can gain more gain more grounds in this region uh but uncertain if they cannot keep up uh, then uh the russian defense can hold uh, russian reinforcement may spell a disaster for the ukrainian forces however on deputy bridge front this seems to be one of the more focused area of this uh, Kherson offensive looks like this is the priori one of the priorities where the ukrainians continue to uh, make uh sensing a lot of reinforcement and uh however the there is rumors uh or you know information coming out from raiba on the 5th of september kostromka was captured by the russian forces however this is immediately disputed by uh, the ukrainian side where they reported russian sh shelling on the very same day so uh, currently this kostromka situation uh, is still not so clear uh, there is also a possibility where the Ukrainians have captured Bilohyaka uh, and uh, there is also more firm information that the Ukrainians have captured Blahodativka. The capture of Blahodativka is much earlier, it's on the 3rd of September. So uh, they launched an attack uh, during the day and uh, by, by the night time they have already captured this position. Uh, this does make sense because uh, the Russian forces over here is actually very deep in the salient. So, uh, it's unlikely that the Russians will actually put too much troops around here, uh, which they might run the risk of getting uh, encircled. So, because uh, forces from the from uh, Ukrainian forces at Endivka or Stukistavok uh, can actually uh, go south and actually cut off reinforcement to Blahodativka. So, even though there was this previous report of fighting at Tanivka, this actually goes nowhere. So, maybe the Russian forces here have. Uh, had uh, sacrificed themselves uh, for basically nothing uh, pretty much like what the Ukrainians also do on the Russian defenses so no war is hell so let's not cel celebrate any death be it from the Ukrainian side or the Russian side I think uh, if you if any of them are your friends you know or you know their wives or girlfriends or family or mother uh, it's not going to be a very pleasant conversation so uh, so you no, know, stay neutral as much as you can. Uh, unless you are very, uh, very invested in this uh, war, then uh, uh, just, just whatever. So uh, interesting thing uh, coming out from the Deputy Bridge Front was that there was leopard tanks. So they wrote German leopards is because leopard tanks are actually developed by the Germans, and uh, as well as something similar to the Finnish uh, ZSU uh, Kids Plus ninety. So this one, this one sounds like an anti aircraft vehicle. Uh, ZSU. So anyway, the 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 currently the pro-Russian sources uh can't really tell you know where these uh leopard tanks come from. It the the initial information say is Italian, but Italians do not uh operate leopard tanks. They have their own tanks, and then uh after that there's an update saying that uh it might be actually Spanish. So I would say that it might also be German, you know, secretly sent to the Ukrainians. So we do not know what is the situation of this because anyway, leopard tanks, could, there are quite a number of mothball ones uh, from the past in Germany. So who knows, uh, they might be giving them some of these very old ones. So, uh, but this is uh, interesting to see leopard tanks uh, appearing on the front. So this will represent the first um, major modern, uh, relatively modern uh, Western tank to actually uh, step foot into this Ukrainian war, uh, whether they will uh, turn out to be useful or they will just we will just see a wreckage of the wreckage of these leopard tanks uh, remains to be seen. So tentatively, uh, good news for the pro-Ukrainians is that we haven't seen any destruction of these leopard tanks. Uh, however, this is just rumors. Uh, who knows? They might actually be uh, misidentified and uh, there's actually no leopard tank. It might just be a Abrams tank. So anyway. Uh, so you can see that uh, the Russians are concentrating a lot of their bombardments over at Atakove, Velika uh, Atakove, Velike Atakove, and uh, this is probably one of these uh, major uh, gathering point or or no uh, forward operating base 
for the Ukrainians where they probably you know cross the river mostly from this area. So um, the interesting thing is also that uh, while the Ukrainian Defense Ministry have not acknowledged the existence of uh, the Kherson offensive, they did report uh, bombardment even on this uh, very very long gone uh, village of uh, Bezimene. So uh, someone in the comments told me that Bezimene actually means nameless. Uh, so interesting that this and that village is actually uh, flattened. So, uh, but they did report on the 4th of September that there is bombardment in this region. So this is a you know, a toxic uh, acknowledgement that they actually launched an offensive. And the same thing go for Suki Stalkiv, uh, sorry, at uh, 4th of September, and then the next day on Kostromka. So this is actually you know verifying the information coming out from Raiba. Remember, the Russian Defense Ministry did not actually report on any of this. All this information actually comes from Raiba, uh, in terms of the how the fighting goes in Kherson. And the Ukrainian side, they the Ministry of Defense also do not report on the offensive. So we are getting most of this fighting information coming out only from Raiba and then these bombardments actually corroborates the information coming out from Raiba that Raiba's information is actually uh, pretty accurate. So unless you say uh, the Ukrainian uh, Ministry of Defense uh, lies and uh, some of their, and, and their information cannot be trusted, then uh, yeah, whatever, man. So um, moving on to the Crybaby front. At the Crybaby front, uh, the most significant information that come out from this front over the past three days was the capture of Visokopilia on the 4th of September. Um, so they took a photo uh, of them uh, putting the, the Ukrainian flag on a hospital. And um, and I probably also you know when I see it after I think for a while, I decided to you know, make a sh YouTube shot and uh, just to throw a bit for those that are claiming that the cursor offensive is you no. Know, is already dead in the water. So I just want to talk about what is the meaning of offensive. Offensive is simply the side trying to attack. They are trying to capture ground. They are launching operations, you know, ground offensive. They are pushing forward. It doesn't matter if they succeed or not succeed. The success is not important. The important thing is that they are actually, you know, trying to move and attack. Um, so if they give up attacking and, uh, they give up ground offensive, then yes, then uh, perhaps uh, the offensive is officially dead, which is a uh, pretty, uh, pretty you know, frequent uh, as we have seen many of these offensive uh, in the southern front from the Ukrainian side unfolded. But this is actually very different. This is really a very major offensive that they continues to fight, and it, the it is actually um, mm -hmm. acknowledged by the by the Russian side that. The Ukrainian uh, offensive is actually very strong, and and then there is even a uh, Raiba coming out the reports that the Russian forces have withdrawn from the southern outskirts of Isokopilia to uh, to avoid encirclement. Although they did try to counter att counter attack uh, at the end of the day, but they did not succeed. The so there is also another piece of information uh, coming out from the Donetsk people's. Republic militias that was tasked to task on defensive duty in the southern front. They do mention that uh, the fighting is very very hard. Um, there are you know drones flying all over the place, uh, making although they the Russians do also send their own drones to try to you know do spotting for the by, for their artillery. The Ukrainians just have more drones, and uh, it makes operation very difficult. And uh, the, this militia actually. Uh, thank the Russian Air Force because without the Russian Air Force they would have have to retreat or will be routed by the Ukrainian forces. So as such you can see that based on that piece of anecdote we can tell that this Ukrainian offensive while you know, they might seem to be so-called technologically uh, uh, inferior to the Russian side perhaps you know, the pro-Ukrainians uh, will actually you know, dispute that but the the reality is, is that on the ground, uh, the fighting is indeed very tough. It doesn't matter the, the Ukrainians actually uh, have a lot of infantry died in this uh, blind uh, suicidal charge. But the the fact is that 
the offensive is still on. The Ukrainians did do indeed have minimum five times more manpower than the Russians in this war, at least five times. So, which is why uh, they dying three times more soldiers doesn't mean that they are losing. They perhaps still winning because you need to kill at least five times more soldiers. So that's uh, so the Ukrainian offensive uh, is still going. However, there is some sensing of it might be slowing down uh, because uh, we haven't seen much. I haven't seen at least no much information on the for the sixth of September, uh, based on the latest information that I've seen that uh, there is that suggests much progress. Uh, still mates uh, ha happening all over the ground. So for for also the pro Russians uh, peeps that are watching, um, you you may this that uh, uh, you might actually you know throw or you know unhappy that I'm saying that the Ukrainian offensive is still going strong. However, just look at what has happened in the Donetsk front. The front line hardly changed for the past month, but I would still say that it's a Donbass offensive, right? It's still on offensive. The Russians are still trying. They are trying trying to attack in multiple settlements is still an offensive so no don't don't be so salty okay um, although i tell you to take salt but don't be salty and uh so otherwise uh there is also very interesting information that suggests that the ukrainians might have captured dubimivka petrivka and uh, Kreschenivka in this area because remember i mentioned that there was no not much report about fighting in this area and, and i personally find it very uh unusual so apparently there it seems like the the ukrainians may have uh, some headways around this region as they report uh shelling over you know at libimivka petrivka and in fact you no know, fourth and fifth which actually you know reinforce that they actually do have this position and also uh the claim you no know, previously mentioned at kreshenivka so uh if this is true if you if the ukrainian lines is true you can see that the Kherson offensive do indeed you know capture quite a bit of the territory however is this is not going to be strategic unless they are able to you know uh, punch all the way through to you know very you no know. because if you capture all this land this this land here are not very important you the more important actually is to to cut off reinforcement you no know, if they can make this push all the way to very slav and uh this entire russian force around here will be you know will be stranded in a massive encirclement uh however the the offensive here seems to be seems to be you know struggling as the russians do recognize the weakness of their entire defensive positions and they have sent uh, countless uh, air force and artillery this way to you know take out the ukrainian forces over here so that's all from the southern front um moving on to the zaporizhia line and uh, as well as the Enohoda, you know, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant region. The Ukrainians, uh, despite the presence of uh, the IAEA, continues to attack the Enohoda city and uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, re plant region as they started to send drones. So the drone attacks uh, happened on the third and the fourth. Uh, they did not really uh, did much as the the Russians actually uh, deployed uh, anti-drone uh, electronic countermeasure countermeasure systems in this region. And uh, the electronic countermeasure actually took over the drones and uh, forced them, forced the drone to actually release the their payloads far, far further away, or they even cause it to you know fall out of the sky. So this is some this one of those uh, uh, technology or capability of the Russian uh, military that was uh, hyped about quite a bit. Uh, that was never really proven uh, in combat. And uh, as the with this war, with the massive usage of drones, uh, the a lot of the analysts has been criticizing that the Russian uh, claims of their you know, uh, their anti-drone or electronic countermeasures are actually you no know, overblown. But uh, with this report, we might also see that maybe the Russians just don't have enough of these systems. Not that the systems doesn't work, but they just don't have enough to spread it across the entire front line. Uh, there is also uh, an, uh, artillery shelling on an order and then uh, on the 5th of September the artillery went back to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant uh, even hitting the uh, the uh, nuclear the nuclear power plant special building number one uh, which seems to be the the prime target uh, since many of the shells did hit there over the past you know, two weeks the Russians did you know 
do the counter battery fires uh, at Nikopo and the Mahanets so to counter the Ukrainian uh, artillery and then we have uh, the the, Zap the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant amph amphibious assault part 2 so the according to the Ministry of Defense of Russia on the 2nd of September there is another attempt by the Ukrainian side to actually launch amphibious assault on the Zaporizhia, region, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant region so they say that two groups of a total of 42 cutters and motor boats uh, probably speed boats I guess cutters cutters usually sounds like a bigger boat so anyway uh, with over 250 servicemen so 250 divided by 42 maybe 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 they are the indeed the bigger boats so uh, the 250 servicemen are special operation forces and foreign mercenaries so they attempt to actually disembark uh, on the shores of Kahovka reservoir near Anagoda and uh, Dnipropetrovsk so actually the Dnipropetrovsk is actually this Dnipropetrovsk so they're probably trying to land around uh, this region here their launching point is actually here at the uh, Veshes Tarif uh, Terasivka and as well as this uh, even harder to pronounce uh, Shevano Dnipropetrovka so oh, that's actually easier to pronounce so the they actually launch points from here and they are trying to land across here to actually do a ground offensive or maybe do sabotage mission not sure since it's only 250 servicemen so maybe they are just to establish a bridgehead however uh, this attempt was uh, detected by the Ukraine uh, by the Russian side and they actually sent the air force after them four Sukhoi 30 and uh, two Ka Ka-52 helicopters actually uh, destroyed 20 of these vessels so half of the vessels is gone so the rest of the vessel actually headed back towards the Ukrainian coast which means that out of the two, over 250 maybe almost half maybe around 120 troops might have uh, killed with this uh, intercept by the Russian Air Force the the vessels went back to their launching point at the uh, Vishya Tarif uh, Tarasivka and uh, Shevano Dniprovka and uh, the Russian artillery actually followed them and they actually fired uh, their artillery on the landing where the forces have this disembark. Uh, however, the they did not really wipe out the entire force, um, and uh, a good number of these uh, Ukrainian uh, soldiers will leave to fight another day. Uh, however, this is a interesting uh, thing that have come out. The in terms of those uh, the anti-Russian side or the pro-Ukrainian side saying that the first amphibious assault uh, does not exist there is actually photo of uh, dead soldiers uh, floating onto the shore of the Dnipro river or the or this reservoir and uh, reportedly the photo is actually taken uh, off the uh, off uh, Nikopo so and the uh, Pro-Russian source Raiba also investigate satellite images, noticing that uh, in the very last uh, satellite image, two of the batch of a set of I think twelve seems to have uh, detached away from the group. Um, however, they themselves are not so sure. The the Raiba themselves are not so sure if this entire amphibious assault is actually true at all. Hundred percent, they are not. They are not hundred percent sure. However, they did also you know question you know whether the Russian Ministry of Defense even needed to actually make this lie at all. Uh, so I personally also think that uh, it's a bit too elaborate to be a to be a lie and uh, something. But however, the the pro-Russian source rival did also you know criticize that the the Russian Ministry of Defense do really need to up their information warfare game because they really can't convince people <laughs> with their reports and uh, they are, they are, the these pro-Russian uh, analysts are really you no. Know, very frustrated by it. Um, on, over at the Zaporizhia line, we have a reported attack by the Ukrainian side against the Russian controlled uh, settlement of Nest Nesterianka. So, according to the pro Russian source driver, they said that the, the Ukrainian forces have been trying to attack this location, uh, this Nesterianka, uh, since the August 31st. And uh, they said that on the 1st of September, four tanks were sent or were taken out 
On the second and third, they use tank to shell, uh, shell some uh, facilities off a uh, Novo and GFK. And then and then they lost a M113 during the attack again on Nesteri Nesterianka. And then the, the even the crews are all killed. So there is some uh, it's not a major offensive, it seems. It seems like some kind of skirmish uh, or moving forward towards Nesterianka. But uh, it does seem to be corroborates that corroborates the capture of Novo Andreevka and uh, Novo Danilivka over here. So I have given the flag to the Ukrainian side to confirm the capture uh, because of this attack at Nesterianka. And uh, as such, the even the Rybas mapping also showed that Novo Danil Danilivka is actually under Ukrainian control, which is why I, I am giving the confirmation on this capture as well. So if not, I'm only actually giving the confirmation on Novo and Drifka. And now uh, with Rybus mapping and due to this attack here, we can confirm that the Ukrainians did in, in fact uh, create more buffer zone around the main, the very important hub of Oryk Kiev. So otherwise, uh, we do not have other uh, offensive reported around the Zaporizhia line. And uh, the over here at the at the Novo Pil uh, area, there there is some uh, there is a confirmation of that uh, Novo Pil is actually captured by the Ukrainian forces. Uh, however, the this is actually disputed. Uh, on the 5th of September, uh, that the Rush this is actually a rumor that the Russian forces have captured Novo Pil. So it's very uh it's still in the, this kind of very gray zone. Actually, I shouldn't put this as a, as a I should put, just put it as a I think it's still safer. But um I just put it in the flag. So currently the state the situation for me now is that this Novo Pil I'm leaning towards this actually under Ukrainian control now. And then there's a rumor that the Russians has recaptured it. So let's see how this goes. Um, then on the Velikan Novosilka region, uh, there is also the rumor that, uh, sorry, there's a rumor that the Russians have captured Vremivka. So this is part of the same sentence that talked about um, the Novopil was captured. So uh, this is just rumor. Uh, so don't don't put too much uh, weight on this information. Um, and then and then we are now in the Donetsk front. At the Donetsk front, um, there is no uh, active uh, combat, uh, rather you no know, ground offensive around this region. However, we do see the Ukrainian claims are uh, spreading further and further away. This time around is at uh, Otia Briske. And uh, this this spreading of uh, you know, reports of Russian bombardments might actually suggest there was some Ukrainian offensive that was totally not reported by any sources. And then the Ukrainians are actually spreading out and uh, capturing more and more grounds. In fact, uh, this actually put Novo Donetsk uh, into question because we have a Zolotan neighbor on the Ukrainian side. And should this... Uh, Oktia Briske be true, then Novo then Donetsk might actually also be under Ukrainian control. So we are still uncertain, you know, uh, what is the actual situation here. So we will just wait for more information. But uh, do note that there might actually this these are all actually, uh, possible hints that there is a Ukrainian offensive that have allowed them to capture all these grounds. Same thing for the situation at Mikulski and Volodymyrivka. So uh, so let's wait and see because all these are part of the what the pro-Russian source like to call the grey zone. So these are parts where no one actually truly controls any any places. It's more part of those no man's no man's land. So no uh so let's see how this goes. Let's see how this goes. Um otherwise uh in this region here you can see that it's all bombardments there is no ground offensive happening around here the main main ground offensive is actually happening around uh the donetsk city the north and north uh, west of donetsk city so where the the major majority of the fighting is actually uh, concentrated towards fighting towards provomyskaya 
where the, in the latest information on the 5th of September, the Donetsk People's Republic has already entered the Pervomaiske uh, village. That means they have already progressed far enough to actually enter the village. That the offensive towards Nevelske actually still continues. Uh, they still have not captured the tiny village over here. And uh, the fighting towards Bodian also continues. And uh, based on latest information that uh, based on latest information, uh, let's see this one. Uh, coming from Pro Russian Source Rider, um, and I also checked their mapping. The western side of the the air base, uh, sorry, the international airport of Donetsk is actually under Ukrainian control. So based on this latest information on the, from the fifth of September, the they say that the Ukrainians actually uh due to the heavy uh, artillery and uh, heavy losses, they actually uh, redrawn from this region on the west of the airport. I personally don't think this is true uh, because usually the reports of uh, redrawals uh, tend to be inaccurate. Uh, we will continue to see the defenders continue to hold their position uh, for another week or two. So, but this actually shows that uh, there is a, the front line is actually looks more like this rather than you know, uh, rather than the previous one that we had all over to Opanne. So, so that also you know corroborates with the information that the fighting towards Opanne comes from Sparta, and uh, so which means the entire area here north of the airport is actually under Ukrainian control. So, so the question is, you know, how far is the Ukrainian reach? So we know that uh, the north of the airport is under Ukrainian control, but we do not know how about the south, because we do have this uh, report uh, of shelling uh, over Vesely. Vesely is this uh, suburb here south of the airport, and uh, so we are not sure if you know this is actually under uh, Ukrainian control or Russian control. The Russian source or Russian people will tell you this is under Russian control, so uh, no idea. And then we have this uh, very weird situation where the, the Ukrainian Defense Ministry on the 5th of September have reported to have defended against Russian attack on Sparta. And in, the, in another piece of information, they say that they have defended themselves uh, actually in the same sentence that they had defended themselves at Shakta Butivka. So Shakta Butivka is actually Butivka mine. And I, I checked the mine is actually south of Sparta, around here. So this is a very weird situation where there could actually be a Ukrainian offensive going through Sparta all the way to this uh, eastern side of the airport and uh, it's totally unreported until you know, suddenly now. So uh, so we, will, we should continue to watch this and see whether this fighting continues to spread further and further. And this might actually suggest that there is a Ukrainian offensive that was not reported uh, south of Edivka. So otherwise, uh, there's no offensive towards Edivka. So if, if this fighting is true, then uh, I don't think the Russians have time to attack Edivka itself, which is a stronghold. Their efforts will be concentrated on defending Donetsk city and uh, pushing back any uh, alleged Ukrainian offences uh, over this area. We do need to know why this happens, uh, this, you know, this information gap happens, because the pro-Ukrainian sites are following uh, operational secrecy. They do not report much on offences. And the Ukrainian Defence Ministry do not report on their offences. The Russian Ministry of Defences do not report literally on anything about all this fighting, they don't report on fighting. And the pro-Russian source, uh, Ryber, they, they are pro-Russia, so they may not be reporting on uh, information that is uh, advantageous to the Ukrainian side. So, the, which is why we are having this uh, information gap uh, when, when it comes to Ukrainian uh, successes on the battlefield. So, that's all from the Divka region. And, uh, there is also this another one that was uh, all the way into Sharikwa Bauka, uh, which we are not sure what's happening there uh, because of this flame. And then uh, there is fighting. Uh, so we are now into the Bakhmut front. So this is the very southern part of the Bakhmut front at uh, Mayos. This is Mayos. So the there is fighting reported on the 4th of September where the the Russian forces is trying to capture the railway station around here. 
otherwise uh, i don't think they have succeeded uh, because the the there is still reported uh, russian bombardment on the 5th of september by the ukrainian defense ministry so this looks like a really hard place to capture apparently so moving on to kodema kodema um, the fighting continues to be around on the western side of kodema the fighting continues up to 5th of september there is still no change in the situation at kodema uh, so so is there a russian offensive yes uh, but have they captured ground uh, not yet you know they have been stuck here for at least a month now um similarly the situation for Saisebe as well this is the same situation uh the last reported fighting is on the 5th of september there's no uh, progress around here Vasila Dolena continues to report fighting up to the 4th of September. We haven't seen anything on it on the 5th. And uh, fighting reported at Bakhmut is reported on the 3rd. So I think after the 3rd, uh, the Russian forces maybe realize that uh, still not the right time. And uh, they just continue to do bombardments on the 4th and then on the 5th. They continue to do bombardments and they, they are now currently holding their lines over on the eastern side of uh, Bakhmut city. Then we have this very interesting uh, report where the Ukrainian Defense Ministry uh, reported that they have defended uh, their position at Perovsky. This report came on the 3rd of September. So not sure if there is actually a Ukrainian offensive that actually helped them capture this position or this might actually be wrongly info, uh, like maybe they are just nearby rather than they are in it. So we are not sure. So we just indicate uh, as for the report, and then we will see, you know, future information will be able to uh, give us more clarity. Um, the fighting at Bamuske continues uh, up to the 4th of September. And uh, at Soleda, you know, they fight until the 5th of September. They're still fighting. Uh, there's no change in the in terms of the situation around uh, this area. You can see that uh, the Ukrainian positions at Soleda and Bamuske continue to be bombarded on a daily basis and uh, the there's still no end in sight in terms of the fighting here at the Soledad area. So moving on to the Sivas front, um, at the Sivas front, uh, the the Ukrainians uh, continue to have to to claim control over Sperne as they reported bombardments or airstrikes around Sperne and uh, however the entire uh, first two three lines of uh, defenses the settlements are all getting bombarded from Vasily to Grozdolivka to Ivano Dalivka to Gimka they all got getting bombarded uh, uh got bombarded uh, on the 5th of September and uh, Sivas got bombarded High Horifa got bombarded so there is no active fighting around here I think the the Russian uh, concentration is all purely on the Bakhmut front uh, the Severs front, they seem to have given up tentatively. So moving on to the Izium front, at the very end of the of the Izium front uh, at the Kriber Luka, there is a fighting reporter at Ozone, or maybe not fighting. So it's actually the Ukrainians actually uh, took some uh, video of them, of them uh, sailing across in a boat, across the river, and then they actually took photo in the area here. And uh, according to the pro-Russian source, uh, Pro Russian source Raiba, oh sorry, Intel Slava, and actually Raiba, they also mentioned this that the you know, this was previously reported as an attack uh, by the Ukrainians on Ozone, and they reportedly captured it by putting a flag. However, um, the end result was that there was photos of some of the Ukrainian soldiers that killed in this area. So, um, According to the pro Russian source driver, they said that this is actually not a very uh, defendable position, which is why they do not have an active defensive position around here. Uh, they mainly uh, have artillery covering this area. So, um, so you no, know, you can believe whatever you want. I have no idea, you no, know, what's the purpose of this if they are not going to push further in. Um, moving on, uh, you can see bombardments everywhere, which is not significant to report. There is another of these are very weird you know, Ukrainian claims. They claim that they have defended themselves at Pasika. So Pasika is this uh, village all the way uh, north, north, sorry, north, northwest of uh, Bohorodashne. 
and um, this is actually a Russian control position. So uh, to say that they are actually defending themselves in the area of Pasika, um, that's very weird. So this information is on the third of September. Uh, so it creates this uh, this another you know, Stegosaurus uh, plate armor plate on top. You can see this is the Stegosaurus you know, plate. You know, one, two, and three. So anyway, uh, so that's that's how it is. Nothing much more to add. And there is also fighting reported at Bahoro Dashni and at Dolena. So all these are reported on the fighting on the 3rd of September. Uh, subsequent reports are not so clear in terms of the fighting sometimes. So uh, so there might be fighting that uh, I'm not reporting. So otherwise, um, that's all from the Izium front. Yeah, that's all from the Izium front. Um, over here at the Balaklia front, uh, we have a bombardment by the Ukrainians on Balaklia itself. And uh, there is heavy bombardments on Husarivka. There is some rumors of an attack by the Russians towards Husarivka on the 6th of September. Uh, I cannot verify this information since uh, I, I just kind of uh, saw it. Uh, I will report it when I do the summary for the next day. So we are now in the Kharkiv front. In the Kharkiv front, um, we have rumors. Uh, this is the very latest rumors that the Russians have captured Paramoha, Baira, as well as Shestakove. So, but these are rumors uh, reported by Intel Slava. However, Intel Slava is an aggregator of uh, Russian Telegram channels. Sometimes the information coming from all these Russian uh, channels are just as bad as the pro uh, pro Ukrainian crazies uh, on Twitter. So. Uh, that's why it's a question mark. I'm not taking the information seriously until I see this on more trusted sources. And uh, otherwise, uh, a lot of bombardments everywhere. And uh, the interestingly is, usually we have the Ukrainian Defense Ministry claiming a lot of places with uh, artillery reports. Uh, we actually do have an artillery report by Raiba on Udi, Sosnivka, Kozacha Lopan as well as uh, Berliki Prokhodi. Uh, allegedly, the Ukrainians actually bombarded these locations. So, uh, whoever they, they are in these positions, uh, both the Ukrainians and the Russians hate you. So, uh, so you know, enjoy the shells. And uh, otherwise, I don't think there's anything uh, else on the Kharkiv front to talk about. So, this is the summary for the day of 192 to 194 for the third to the fifth of September. The Ukrainian uh, major super duper uber Kherson counter offensive or the offensive, or now they have this new name called the uh, the battle for Kherson uh, continues. The pace the pacing seems to slow down a little bit, um, but the offensive is still real. It's still dangerous. It's still continuing for the Ukrainian side against the Russians. So uh, don't, write, don't write it off yet. Uh, you can only write it off when I tell you to write it off. Okay, so anyway, this is the summary and I'll see you in the next update.